Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to episode 82 of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, author, media and PR coach, copywriter, editor and proofreader, and founder of Vegan Business Media, a content, events and training platform providing success tips for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. In this episode, I interview Kat Mendenhall, vegan lifestyle coach and educator who also sells custom-made vegan cowboy boots and other accessories in Dallas, Texas. After many years working in corporate sales, Kat found her calling to mend the world through whole, plant-based nutrition and cruelty-free products. She's a master vegan lifestyle coach and educator certified by the Main Street Vegan Academy, a culinary nutrition expert certified by the Academy of Culinary Nutrition, holds a certification in plant-based nutrition by the T. Colin Campbell Foundation at Cornell University, and is certified as a Food for Life instructor by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. In 2013, Kat, who's a native Texan, launched her handmade goods business under her eponymous brand with her signature line of custom vegan cowboy boots. Made from a patent microfiber material, which is designed to have a leather grain look and a natural appearance, the boots come in a range of styles and customers get to tailor the finish to their liking, including choosing the material, toe shape, heel height and stitching colour, which is pretty cool. (laughs) In this interview, Kat discusses the challenges of running a boot making business, which is a dying trade, without any previous experience in the fashion industry. Why she takes a custom made handcrafted approach to her boots and how this sets her apart from other shoe wear businesses. Why she chooses to have the boots made in Texas. The importance of running your business the way you want to and defining what success means to you. How the skills she gained working in corporate America have helped her to run two different businesses under the one brand. How she got and continues to get mainstream media coverage for her brand. How developing a community around her brand and being involved in her local community has resulted in her success. And much more. Here's the interview with Kat Mendenhall. Hello, Kat. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Katrina. So happy to be here and to talk to you and your audience. Oh, wonderful. I'm very excited to learn about your, even learn about your business because you do vegan cowboy boots as well as some other things which we're going to talk about. But the vegan cowboy boots got me really excited. I think it's so cool. And I love that you've, yeah, you've really filled a gap in a market and I love your, your products. And as I said to you earlier, I'm definitely going to put, be putting in an order at some stage as well. So really glad to be chatting with you. And I love your tagline, mending the body body and mind through plant-based nutrition and cruelty-free products. I love the way you've played on your name, Mendenhall and Mending. That's really, really smart. And it also allows you to kind of, I guess, have this umbrella brand for your different businesses because they're quite different businesses, Um, vegan lifestyle coaching and cooking instruction and selling your custom-made vegan cowboy boots. So the first question I ask everyone that I have on the show is why. Tell us about your reasons for running your business. What's your why? Well, my why has actually always been the animals. And starting out, I had really no idea that I would fall into a position to be coaching, cooking, and creating vegan boots and other non-leather products. But my mission all along was to bring awareness to the fact that we no longer need to support the um, animal food and fashion industry, the way that we support it today with cruelty to animals, that there's alternatives and those, those alternatives provide us better results, whether it be for our health, for the environment, and obviously for the quality of the animals. But my, my vision really is just to protect the animals, be a voice for the animals, um, and part of that vision of seeing cruelty into animals is my mission, which is to to do my part in educating people in how to live a lifestyle that would bring less cruelty 
in the world. Wonderful, wonderful. And I love that you've you've managed to do that, uh, yeah, by providing alternatives as well as raising the the education and awareness levels through the other side of your business as well. So, and I, when I did my research in you, I found you've actually got quite a strong background in sales. So I'm kind of curious how you kind of made that switch and got into what you're doing now, and also which came first. So, did the lifestyle nutrition side come first, or the boots? So that's a great question because I I was. Absolutely, a few years ago, I had no idea what I was going to do. I was in a career for over 25 years, sales, sales management at an executive level, but I was the person that was staring out the window every day, daydreaming about <laughs> doing something that I was more passionate about. I would spend my time at the office um, on Pinterest or on the internet looking at food photos or at fashion um, different lines of clothing, and I just got to the point where I was like, I have to make a change. So initially what happened is I found out about a vegan lifestyle through um, just a way to improve my health. So, yes, it started out as a, a health path for me, a health journey. I didn't really – I wasn't sick. I didn't have any, you know, symptoms that sometimes people have when they start looking into this diet. I just wanted to feel healthier and be healthier, and I happened to run across Alicia Silverstone's book, The Kind Diet. I read it straight through, and I said, hey, this sounds really good. I'm going to give this a try. And, of course, it was a really good move, and it made me feel wonderful, and so I just continued to eat that way. Um, but as we all do, no matter which direction we come to veganism, through either food or through animals or through the environment, we start to learn the full realm, right? Right. So through that, uh, it took a few years, but I had that aha moment one day where I was stuck behind a cattle trailer and I made eye contact with these cattle and, and the cattle on the back of the trailer. And I knew probably their fate because I grew up around cattle ranching. And it was at that moment that I thought to myself, wow, these last few years, you think that the animal to mouth connection, but you've never made the animal to wear connection. And it literally, and, and that hit me like that. And I thought, there's no way that I can continue to support, you know, uh, an industry that, again, um, brings cool or cruelty to animals through, you know, raises animals just for what we put on our bodies or what we carry or what we set on. So it was kind of a, a journey, but it was definitely a aha moment I had when I made that animal to wear connection and decided that I wanted to be a, a fashion activist. So outside of being a, a vegan activist, which I feel like I do through educating and helping people on their, um, I don't like to call it a diet, but their eating lifestyle. Right. Um, I now really label myself as a fashion activist because I'm trying to educate people and bring awareness to the fact that animals are raised solely for their skins or their fur. And with technology and the alternatives, again, alternatives have given us, opened us a, to a door that we no longer have to make those choices. Mm. Uh, we should definitely uh, support these industries and, and companies that are choosing uh, man-made materials. Absolutely. So that's really kind of how to, it evolved. Fantastic. I love that. And who are your mate in terms of the, the, the cowboy boots particularly? Because you're in Texas. And as you say, because I remember when you, you just said about the cattle ranching, when I grew up watching the TV show Dallas uh, in the 80s, right. completely oblivious to the fact that even though I saw these cows, I think, I, I don't know, I just mentally just didn't even click that, you know, these cows were going to be killed or what have you. I was just too embroiled in the dramas of Sue Ellen and JR. But anyway, um, you're in, you know, you're in, you know, like you say, real kind of cattle country. So I'm curious how that kind of operates in terms of you, you know, being, uh, you know, particularly making vegan cowboy bits. Are the majority of your customers or your clients already vegan or are you actually attracting uh, to non-vegan people and particularly in Texas? And I'm just curious about how your business is received on a local level. So surprisingly, Katrina, I actually deal, I would say 90% of my clients are not vegan. Really? And that's on the, wow. That's on the, yeah, on the nutrition side and um, not necessarily on the boots. On the boots, it's probably 50-50. But on the nutrition side, I have a lot of clients that they just want to eat better. So their goal isn't necessarily to be 
you know, vegan or really to put a label on any type of way that they're eating. But they've maybe been to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, you maybe need to lose a little weight. You're, you know, you've got some history of diabetes or heart disease or high cholesterol or, or maybe they already have those symptoms. Um, and of course they hear all the things in the news, all the things in the media that says you need to have more smoothies, you need to eat more cow, <laughs> you need to go to your local farmer's market and buy all your food. And these people just don't know what to do with that. So again, a lot of my clients I work with on the nutrition side, um, I would say 90%, their goal is not to be vegan. And I'm okay with that. Now they know, they have an understanding that I am a vegan cook. And I'm only going to show them how to make plant-based meals. And then what they choose to do to add to that, you know, is, is up to them. They can do that. And on the food side, really, my goal has always been to cater to non-vegans. Uh, of course, I want the vegan community, and they've been extremely supportive. But they're going to find me, right? As vegans, we seek out anybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got our radar on. <laughs> yeah. Anybody making vegan food, anybody making a vegan product, you know, we're on alert. So my, I've always tried to market and reach the people, mainstream consumers, again, from the standpoint of, Vegan products can have the same quality, they can still be beautiful, but you're not sacrificing quality or luxury because you're choosing an alternative material. Um, so I've really just tried to market that way, and it, it really has been um, a success for me because it, now it's taken it some time, so it didn't happen overnight for sure, but because I've just stayed really consistent in the way that I wanted to do business and how I wanted the quality and the standards of my product and the clientele that I was trying to reach. I'm now after almost three years starting to see those people are coming around and it's, I'm so excited, right? It's a really happy time right now because I feel like I'm reaching those people and I'm getting a lot of media attention here in Dallas. They just did one of the mainstream magazines just did a full article on the boots and um so that's that's winning as a vegan as a community that's winning that we're reaching those people fantastic i love that i really love that thank you for, for sharing that so a lot of the uh, and one of the things you've just touched on in terms of the the quality of your your boots so, so one of the things that i think a lot of small business owners and particularly the more ethical and vegan business owners as well find that because they're not making mass produced products obviously their products are at the higher end of the the scale now you've chosen to create custom made um, vegan boots and products and obviously that attracts a higher cost of purchase to, to the consumer which is fair enough so but tell us why and the benefits and disadvantages of this approach so that's a great question and, and I really have to educate my customers on everything that you just touched on first of all it's true I'll, I'll address the materials. Um, a lot of people think that my materials are going to be cheaper because they're man-made materials, and it's absolutely the opposite. Now, we're used to having faux products that were made with PVC, which is a, a plastic material, and those products were meant to be cheap, throwaway products. So, But we're not doing that anymore. We're using a different type of technology, a different type of materials that are made up with completely different components. It's a polyurethane base, so there's no off-gassing, there's no plasticizers, and those materials are more expensive. Yes, the company that I purchase from, they, the larger quantities that I buy, the cost goes down. But I can't do that from a, a financial resource and also from a storage resource. You know, I'm very limited in my space. So even if I had the monetary uh, resources to buy in larger bulk to save, I wouldn't have anywhere to put the material because I'm just a small, you know, shop. So that's a challenge. And I think that will continue to be a challenge, um, you know, maybe until if your business grows to a point where, you know, there, there's probably a line where you're producing so much that it, it would make sense. And also you're also talking at that point of maybe moving into a larger space, right? That's just right. kind of how, how your business grows. But for me, as far as the, the custom and handcrafted, 
When I started out on this mission, I wanted to do business the way that I wanted it to be done. And I wanted them made in Texas. I wanted them, I wanted anybody to be able to wear a pair of boots because there's so many people that I've met over my lifetime that, you know, I, w- I was a big mo- boot maven. I wore boots everywhere and people would always comment and they would say, yo, you know, I really wish I could wear boots, but I've got big calves or I've got this bunion on my foot or I've got, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> people... Now, believe me, now that I'm making them, people tell me all their foot and (laughs) ankle and leg problems, but that's okay because that's the beauty is that we can accommodate that because they're all custom handmade. Um, I know the quality that goes into a handcrafted product, especially a boot. The handcrafted boot making is a trade that is slowly slipping away. So it's also a way for me to preserve something that is a Texas emblem that's part of my heritage and just something that's dear to my heart. So, yeah, I could go to um, Mexico, to Leon, Mexico, which is where a lot of the manufacturing is for boots and um, also clothing, like that we do, you know, between the United States and Mexico. Um, but there's challenges with that, too, right, because you, you have to worry about quality control, um, you have to worry about um, importing them back into the States. I mean, so to me, it was quality over quantity. I would much rather produce something that was special, handcrafted, and had the customization that anybody could wear a pair of boots that they wanted to. And then also because my name is attached to it. Right, I, yeah. That, like, I... You know, I have high standards for myself, and if I'm creating a product and I'm sending it out there, then I want to I want to sleep at night. I want to know when my boot maker's sending out a pair of boots that the person receiving them 99% of the time are going to be ecstatic about them. So, you know, that that was really important as far as the way that I created them and, and was doing the business the way that I wanted it to be done. Great. No, I love that. I just want to touch on a couple of things. I love the fact that you've said that it's about doing the business you the way you want to do it. Because sometimes we often think, oh, well, having a successful business means it must be big and, you know, done in this way. But that's not necessarily, you know, everyone's definition of success. So I love that you've, uh, yeah, you've created your own um, concept of success and run your business in that way. I love the fact that your boots are custom made. As I say, when I was having a look on the site, before we got on and I thought I thought oh my gosh you know you can choose the shape of the toe and you can choose the color of the stitching even the height of the heel I was like oh my god that's so cool so I think that's something that really helps to um to yeah for you to stand apart um which is fantastic right. fantastic um so what were some of your key challenges well you've touched on this a little bit uh, about some of the key challenges so what as you've started to grow a little bit and your, your you know your business has be, become well you've grown a lot but and you know your business has become quite well known how have those challenges changed well the i mean i would say the challenges that I deal with on an ongoing basis kind of, and I think that will continue to be a challenge is that technology is continuing to change and improve the materials that I use. So it's a constant um, search and research and a trial and error process to, to get the materials. Um, it's also a really unique environment in that people who work, this was really a shocking um, experience for me when I started doing this because I obviously had no background in boot making or starting a company or <laughs> anything designing or the creative part of it. And the, so I reached out to people because I'm like, okay, you know, I depend a lot on a community. I depend a lot on mentors. So who, who can connect me to people who are familiar in this business and maybe already have a product and know where to go? And people are just really kind of shh about it you know they don't want to share and I just thought that was really strange uh-huh. <laughs> uh, yeah so it really has been me just researching on my own and trying to find and I think that will just continue 
to be a challenge as I've moved forward because as, you know, people contact me and they're like, oh, what about this new pineapple material? And what about this material being made? I think now of like grapes or something. So, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. mushrooms as well. It's like, uh, yeah, I, know. <laughs> it's great. I know, right? So <laughs> mushrooms, you know, and so, um, I think this is wonderful what's going on. Now, those materials aren't necessarily a good fit for what I'm using it for. Um, we have to have materials that obviously are durable, you know, pliable, water resistant, uh, breathable. Um, but, but that, that is definitely a challenge as technology continues to advance. It's a good challenge, right? Because then you want to continue to improve your product and I definitely want to do that and I want to continue to create new products. So um, always researching and finding the newest, latest, greatest, uh, most environmentally friendly and sustainable product out there is is an ongoing challenge. And then, too, like I touched on about the boot making just being a dying art. A lot of these boot makers are third, fourth generation boot makers, and they really aren't interested in um, teaching or, or having their trade go on to – the next generation because they kind of see it as a, a dying trade that, you know, we've outsourced so much of our shoemaking and, and cobblestone and things like that to other countries that people can't afford to really make a living doing that trade here in America anymore. Now, I know there's some people, um, especially vegan companies, who are trying to bring, you know, trying to change that by, like I am, trying to have a, a company in Texas using all USA-made materials. Um, but I, that's, a, I think, an ongoing challenge for everybody that's in some type of product development or manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I can relate to that. I know when I took a pair of my vegan boots that I got um, to get to, just the heels like, repaired, and I went to this lovely old Italian boot maker, and he's been at this place, you know, for years and years. And he said, oh, he said, when I, he said, when I retire, it'll all just close. I said, well, haven't you got an apprentice? He said, oh, they've stopped doing apprenticeships in, you know, repairing of shoes. And I thought, how sad, you know, we're in this kind of throwaway culture. Um, so I can definitely relate to what you're saying. So in terms of that, Kat, how does it work with your boot? making do you make them yourself or well, you mentioned that you work with boot makers so talk us a little bit about, uh, through the process so how long does it take you know when, once somebody's made an order how does it kind of what do you kind of have to do right so I do have a, I have a dedicated boot maker that has been in the handcrafted boot making business for over 25 years um, so he does all the you know the building part of the boot um, I work a lot on the design side, the creative side, and he certainly guides me in that because of his experience um, on what we can do and what we can't do. Um, but the beauty is making a boot is basically like a blank canvas. So there's not, not really nothing that we can't design and do. I've just started off really slow as far as having um, – not really slow, but I'll, simple, by having simple designs with stitching patterns and then – allowing people to change the colors of material and the colors of stitching and, and of course, the toe box shapes and heel hides. But we can do what's called cutouts. We can do inlays. We can do really, really fancy things. Um, but, yeah, so he does all that part, and I do more, of course, running my company, the business side of it, and doing the creative side, and also just coming, coming up with new product ideas that I can take to him to um, – make you know a prototype uh, but the boots themselves um, take about um, on our website we say four to six weeks but it's really about a two to four week process just depending on the you know how our, our production at the time how busy we are right got it got it now that makes sense so how do you, I'm curious how you manage running two very different types of businesses so um and and I'm, so I wonder if you can sort of talk us through maybe some of the challenges or the advantages of doing both I'm curious for example if there's any crossover so if you've got a nutrition client you know can you kind of on sell them a pair of boots and buy this <laughs> <laughs> well I Really, I keep them pretty separate. Um, I mean, I, if I'm doing something on the nutrition side, like let's say I'm doing a cooking class and it's with an audience that, you know, doesn't really know who I am, 
then, you know, I obviously focus on my cooking cer- certifications and my nutrition certifications and my experience, but, you know, I also throw in that I'm a vegan boot maker. Um, but yeah, I really managing them is super simple. Just, I guess, based on my experience and being in um, corporate America for so long and um, having skills of you know, management and organization and um, just being able to, um, you know, just separate the two has been pretty easy. And I really rely a lot on tools of the Internet. (laughs) So I have a lot of automation so clients can go in. They can look at my calendar. They can schedule online. They can pay for classes online. They can book me. Um, so the automation tools are really, really important and helping me as far as time management and keeping like the nutrition side, uh, working effect, you know, efficiently. Um, and I do the same thing on the boot, but I really am more, a little bit more involved hands on in the boot process just because it's, um, you know, there's more little parts of it that have to be worked on between the customer and then of course the boot maker. Um, but what I really like is um, using the tools that are available and then also, you know, again, this didn't happen overnight. I always tell people, you know, the reality is in the beginning, you know, I was having to develop all my content. I was having to research for all my cooking classes and, and developing meal plans for clients. And, you know, that that's a lot of work. And so a lot of people don't always see you know, the back end work and when you're working, right, 60, 80 hours a week. (laughs) Because I always say, like, that's not sexy, right? Nobody wants to see that because that's not sexy. (laughs) What what people want to see is, um, you know, when you're, yeah, when you're doing the classes, being successful or or getting, you know, on a podcast or being, you know, in a a piece of media, you know, people think, oh, wow, that's sexy. That's cool. But they don't see all the work that it took you to get there. And it's definitely was a lot of work. But now that I've been doing it a few years, um, you know, again, a lot of the content that I developed is already there, so I can just tailor it to meet different client needs or different, you know, scenarios and um, and relying a lot on, like I said, the, the tools that are available on automation. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. Now, in terms of competition, and I've kind of put that in air quotes, you know, there's obviously now a more diverse range of vegan fashion, although I reckon you've probably still cornered the market on vegan cowboy boots, um, as well as vegan lifestyle nutrition coaches. So I'm curious, how do you go about standing out both, say, within the vegan business arena, but also, as you say, uh, to the mainstream public? So that. It's part of a, a course that I'm, I'm actually getting ready to, to teach for the first time because I, I had a lot of people that were consulting with me about, you know, their idea and how do they start. And, and so this is a really good question because a part of that course of what I tell people, uh, a few things is, first of all, if you're looking to take either some type of idea you have or even like for me, wanting to be a, a vegan fashion activist and how do I – I create a business out of that. You have to really put stock in yourself. You have to invest in you. And I spent a lot of time in the beginning investing in me. So I got the credentials. I earned the credibility. Um, The next thing that I had to do was really decide, did I have a viable idea? Did I have a viable business? And... Um, you know, after I, I looked up and saw that there were no vegan boots, obviously I thought, okay, hey, maybe there's a good market for that. But up until the time that I, you know, op- I say open my doors, but release my website, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I still wasn't sure, you know, if anybody would bomb. And, and it took a while, you know, like to even grasp that, yeah, this, this is working out. And even on the nutrition side, as far as um, having – you know, what I was good at and what I I thought I could do to earn a living, was that something of interest to someone? So you really got to do your research. Um, And I I did those things. But I think executing to be successful, and those were the things that I brought from my former career. But the the reason I'm saying all this and why why does this matter to competition is because I think there's a lot of people out there that – maybe not on the product side, but definitely on the nutrition side that 
um, don't have the credibility, don't have the credentials, um, really haven't defined their brand and the business that they want to do. And I think that's really confusing to people. Um, so I always say, like, you know, again, sticking to how you want to do business, but don't be a copycat. Don't try to be like everybody else. Be genuine. Be yourself. And, you know, you gotta, you really got to walk the talk. And I think that's what people see on the nutrition side and the boot side of me is that, you know, I put in the time. I put in the research. I invested in me. But I wasn't trying to be anybody else. I was just doing being me and being genuine about it. And um, I, you know, everything that I tell everybody and everything that I do, I I walk the talk. And I think that's what stands out. And you definitely have to stand out, you know, because the, the world is just, it's, as we all know, it's very competitive. So um, I just try to be me. Absolutely. I love that. So there's a couple of things I wanted to mention there. And one was about, I love the fact that you mentioned about how, yeah, people see the success and they're like, oh, yeah, that's great. I want to start a business because it all looks so glamorous and fabulous. And like they say, they don't see the behind the scenes thing. I mean, I posted recently a very rare photograph of me just from the side um, with no makeup on, you know, my glasses on, hunched over my computer saying, you know, this is what I'm doing behind the scenes. And it was interesting. It got so many likes. And I just thought people, were, I think they're relieved when people do share that kind of thing because they think, oh, Maybe it's just me that's having to, you know, work really, really hard. But then they're like, oh, no, actually, you know, these people that we perceive to be, you know, successful over are also doing the hard yard. So I love that you mentioned that. Um, and the second thing was about the credibility, because I know um, I've, like, particularly in certain marketing or coaching circles, there's this whole thing of, oh, people don't care about your qualifications. They just care if you can solve their problem. But I don't think that's necessarily the case, particularly in something like health and nutrition, um, you know, or even, you know, psychology or, you know, therapy of any kind like that. I think people do do really value the fact that you've got certain qualifications or like you said you've invested your time and your energy to learn this stuff and get some kind of uh, yeah um, qualification and credibility so I'm really glad that you you brought that up that's fantastic in terms of marketing then Kat well, what have been the key marketing strategies you've used to grow your businesses well that definitely has been a struggle for me um, I, I came from a strong sales background as you mentioned but I didn't come really from a marketing background uh, which a lot of people think they're tied together sometimes but in the corporate environment they're not they're completely separate <laughs> um, but I you know this has really been Katrina a uh, trial and error for me I've tried different tactics and really at the end of the day what I figured out um, is I have to look at the market, marketing that's going to that's going to reflect my brand, and I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I'm using different tactics that's really going to make my brand be specific and unique, and um, that sometimes it's doing marketing in an unconventional way. Because I've tried to do it a very conventional way, and I found that that wasn't successful. Doing ads in magazines, showing up at VegFest, um, actually hiring, you know, some marketing people to help me with certain things. And really, those just, I didn't see my return on my investment, and that's, we're in business, okay? Um, yes, I do this for the animals, but at the end of the day, I have a mortgage, I have a car payment, I have kids. Uh, you know, I have my daughter's getting married next year, and oh my god! <laughs> so, so you know, it's like we. That's I. I. This is my full time job. You know, of being a vegan activist and a fashion activist. So, um, I have found that really the marketing it, again is using online tools and doing things that are a little bit um, out of the box, doing more. Um, like mainstream events. I do an event here in Dallas that's at our, our state fair of Texas, which of course is the biggest state fair in the world. Um, but we, they do a celebrity, um, chef, uh, demonstration every day, like six or seven of them per day. And our fair goes on for three weeks. Well, the last three years I've gone and I've done one that I don't get paid to do it. I have to make food for like a hundred samples. So it's a lot of work, but that's gotten me a lot of exposure. 
and then I'll get a call about something else, you know. So I think we have to really think outside of the box when it comes to marketing and think, I, I don't think I said it very clearly earlier, but by thinking outside the box, really consider your brand and how you can uniquely position that in a way that may not be in, in a traditional, conventional way, because that, that's what's worked best for me. And it's continued to evolve. I'm not, I'm not great at it. And uh, I just continue to take risk, and I continue to kind of uh, try different tactics. Got it, got it. So I like that you're you're appealing. You're instead of not necessarily going to veg fest, but going to more broader uh, events and festivals like mainstream events to to target non vegans. Right, absolutely, and and that's what we're. I mean, I'm again. That's my vision and my mission. So as a vegan entrepreneur, it's much. There's more to me in this and what I'm doing than just the business, and that's a great reminder when you're faced with obstacles and challenges and marketing can be very challenging for a lot of people. It's definitely for me because there's just so many options out there and you, you know, you put a lot of money into it. So, uh, you know, again, as a vegan entrepreneur, um, I have to keep in mind that I'm doing this more. There's more to it than just the business. Um, And that really helps me and, with some of the challenges of the business. Got it. Now, now you mentioned you'd been featured in some media, and particularly local media and Dallas-based mainstream media, which is fantastic. How did that come about, Kat? Did you kind of pitch them, or did they just kind of hear about you and find you and approach you? Yeah, well, you know, you were just talking about luck, and I I wanted to say, because this is is tied to that, you know, a lot of people would look at this and just be like, oh, my gosh, she's so lucky. Well, no, not really. Um, <laughs> again, it's, a lot of, it's, it's been a, a lot of work over the last few years of me, like I said, going to non-conventional um, events or non-vegan events, doing things a little differently. But I also think that it, it sounds a little cliche, but when you're working in favor of the universe, then the universe will respond accordingly. And it just so happened that, uh, a good friend of mine here in Dallas uh, that's well known in the Dallas community and the vegan group, but she also um, bought a pair of boots. So I worked with her on a special design at boots. She ran into someone that she knew who's a freelance writer. He found out about the boots. He contacted me. He wanted to do a story to pitch to local media. Um, he did. They took it. They put it on their online uh presence and then after it was online the um, magazine the editor called me and said okay we want to do we want to have you in our next issue Um, so it just kind of evolved and if that one situation is still evolving I have three interviews this week for other mainstream media things that came just from that (laughs) so that's yeah, fantastic. And, That's so and I, cool. I didn't do anything. All I did was just make boots. <laughs> well, you showed up. You showed up. Do you know what I mean? Like you said, you, you that, got yourself yeah. out there. You, you weren't just kind of hiding away, trying to do everything online and not going out in kind of real life. So I think that's a really good uh, lesson and example, you know, sometimes just by getting out there, it gets you noticed as well. Because sometimes people are very, and I love online, don't get me wrong, I mean, I love Facebook in particular, but there's nothing quite like getting out there in real life. Um, um, and you know, being seen, you never know who you're going to bump into, who may know someone, who may know someone. And uh, I love that that's uh, come about as as that. That's brilliant. Now, one of the questions well, I yeah, go on. Sorry, you're going to say. Sorry, something. I just wanted to make a really good point of what you just said. That I just was talking about that very subject this weekend with a friend about, like I said, I didn't know how to create boots, to start a business, and to do everything that I'm doing today, but I showed up because I made a commitment and I said, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to show up every day and I'm going to get through whatever I have to get through to learn this and to do this. Um, but yeah, I also showed up. I took risk and I had a mentor in the very beginning that said, don't say no to anything, even if you don't know how to do it. And of course, you know, fear can be a stop sign for people. 
And when we hear that, we think, oh, gosh, you know, well, if I can't do it, I'm not going to say I can go do it. But by saying yes to things that you can't do, it pushes you out of your comfort zone and it makes you learn things and do things. And I have lived by that rule for the last three years. You know, I've been asked to come do things or, or whatever. And, um, you know, I was like, oh, my God, I don't know how to do that. But then you figure it out and then you go do it. And when we're doing something with our passion, your passion doesn't drive success. Your success drives your passion. But if you're not out there, like you said, showing up or taking risk, then you're going to miss out on that. Absolutely. No, I love that. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, now, just in terms of the word vegan, this is another question I always like to ask every business because there's all so many different answers and there's no right or wrong. So I notice you obviously don't shy away from the word vegan, you know, on your website. It's like, boom, right there in front of you. And I'm curious because I know you said a lot of your customers, particularly on the nutrition side, are non-vegan. So it, tell us a little bit about your choice of whether or not to use the word, because I know some health practitioners, for example, don't use vegan. They might use plant-based. They might use nothing at all because they don't want to put off uh, other clients coming to them. Like my partner's a naturopath and a hypnotherapist, and she sees cattle farmers, and they come to her because they've no idea that she's you know, plant-based and going to be right. <laughs> encouraging them to do that. So I'm just curious. Talk a little bit about your choice um, of how, whether or not and how much and how prominently to use use the word vegan in your branding and your marketing? Yeah, that's a great, really great question, Katrina. And as we know, in the vegan community, it can be a, a sense of debate going on on that, right? Well, yeah. for me, <laughs> right, as I mentioned earlier, um, and, and this is, I'm not saying this in a judgmental way, but I'm vegan for the animals. And so my whole lifestyle reflects that. Um, I will say I don't like labels. I think labels are for tin cans, I always say. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I like to call an ace an ace. And my ace is I'm a vegan. And so I'm proud of that. And I'm not going to apologize for it. And if that, if that makes someone else feel uncomfortable, well, the fact that they're not vegan or they're not calling themselves vegan, that, you know, that doesn't make me feel uncomfortable. So why should me calling myself make them feel uncomfortable? Um, but I also realized that I'm not the right person to work with everybody, you know. So if somebody's uncomfortable working with me because I use that word strongly or I, I don't shy away from it, then they're probably not the right person for me. They probably need to go to someone that has a little bit different approach. Um, so, you know, I always say we need the fruit platter, right? We need people out there. Some people are the oranges. Some people are the apples. Some people are the bananas. Some people are the grapes. You know, we need the whole fruit platter out there um, trying to educate and get people, more people to become vegan. And how they want to call it, that's up to them. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm real adamant on just, the fact that my, my products are vegan. And I also think there's an education in that, right? Because there's so much misinformation out there of, well, you know, what's a vegetarian? What's a vegan? What's a pescatarian? What, what about the vegans that eat honey? And what about the vegans that eat processed food? And what's a healthy vegan? And what's a junk food? You know, so we put yeah. all these labels on everything. And at the end of the day, you know, again, my mission is I'm vegan for the animals, so it doesn't matter if I'm a no salt or no oil vegan or, you know, none of that really matters to me, but um, it, it definitely there's a lot of confusion out there. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. Now, you mentioned you've come from this long background in corporate America, so and now you, you're running your own business. So what advice would you offer to people listening to this? And maybe they want to start a business of some kind and they want to run it on ethical vegan principles. What should they take into account, in your opinion, Kat? Well, I think what's really important, I, I touched on a few earlier as far as, you know, them investing in themselves and making sure they had a viable market, doing their research on Google, um, you know, that's the best place to go, um, invest in themselves, find online courses or, you know, when I, when I quit my corporate job, I initially went back to college. So that was kind of like my first step because I didn't know what direction I was going to go, but you have to take that first step. I think what's been extremely important for me that I really stress with, uh, when I do consulting is you have to develop a community. So you have a great idea. Um, you've done your research, you are ready to execute it, you need a community behind you. And not your 
your family and friends aren't necessarily the best community to have, um, <laughs> right? I always say, you know, y'all, I've, I've been able to create this amazing vegan community behind me, uh, which I, it's been amazing and supportive. And I have all these wonderful friends now that, you know, it's just, it's great to have that support behind you. But you also need to reach out to people in your community you know, I'm a part of a women's professional group here in Dallas. I do other local women entrepreneur things that aren't vegan. So, right. you know, you have you have to have a, a different sense of community because you draw um, information from all their different experiences and their different approaches. So that's important. The last thing that I would say is having mentors. And mentors have been extremely important to me as far as helping me be successful. You need a mentor that can praise you and build you up and encourage you and support you. You also need a mentor who can be real with you and kind of like in your face and, you know, um, and challenge you. Um, And and I definitely have those people. Um, You need somebody that, you know, you can – bent to, especially as a solopreneur, um, and I'm a solopreneur, it's just me doing this, and so it's a very isolating um, job to have, and I think for any entrepreneur, unless you have a partner, most people will say how isolating it is, but having those mentors and having that community, strong community behind you is important for your success. I love it. I love that. Yeah, I love that you've said that. Cause sometimes we can get a bit sort of, you know, we just want to hang out with other vegans. And I, I love what you said about it. it is important to go to these other types of events and mix with other different types of professionals, even though I know it can be challenging. One of the things people often say is, oh, I don't like going to those places where they're serving food because, you know, they're serving the animal bodies up and it can be really frustrating. But it, it's worth going there to, because, A, you can have an influence uh, on yeah. that potentially. And like you said, you can draw from that much broader um, skill set. So I think that that's fantastic. Now, one of the, as we get to wrap up now, Kat, one of the things that often people are, are curious about when they want to start off their own business, obviously there's some startup costs involved. So if, if you're comfortable with sharing, how did you kind of figure all that out and, and what tips or anything have you got on that, on funding a business? So, yeah, I completely went about this the wrong way. <laughs> I'll be the first <laughs> So I... I, I wouldn't necessarily take my advice on this, but I have to, I'm a pretty open book and I have to be real with people. Um, so when, when I left my corporate job, I did have some payout from them, which gave me some breathing room to kind of, again, invest in me and to allow me to take the time off to do that without having to work. Um, I know not everybody has that um, ability so I always tell people, you know, if you're having to keep your full-time job, then do what you can at night on the weekends to invest in yourself um, and, you know, helping with your credibility and your credentials. But um, I've done everything completely self-funded. Um, that has, you know, can be good or bad. I wanted to be self-funded because I wanted control over everything. And I think when we do some of these other type of um, – either investing investors or taking a loan. I didn't want the risk of that. Um, any type of, you know, crowdfunding. I didn't want to be accountable and responsible to other people. So I said, you know what, I'll do what I can. I'll have to start slow. I'll have to really negotiate with people. Um, and I, because I was in sales, again, I brought my experience from my previous career into this business and I was able to negotiate uh, payment and terms, you know, with people that allowed me to kind of build this um, slowly and gradually by funding it, you know, myself. Um, so, again, it's, it may not be the best advice, but, um, you know, and a lot, you know, people, the reason I never did this before is for some of the same reasons that, you know, some of your listeners are probably thinking, you know, either it's a, they don't have the time They don't have the resources Um, and there's, you know, family challenges that a lot of people have. And I've definitely in the past have had all those. But again, you know, I worked 28 years, so I was in a little bit different situation where I had this long, you know, career that allowed me to kind of step back and 
try to take a shot at, you know, doing something different. Got it, got it. Now, I appreciate you sharing that. It's always interesting to know the, the different ways and paths that people choose to take. And I've certainly had, you know, quite a few people I've interviewed that say, no, I absolutely don't want investing. I don't want to give even a small part of my business or my company away. And others that are like, oh, no, I want to, we want to kind of go big quite quickly. And so they do do that. So it's always really good to, to hear about different people's experiences. And you work with what you've got. And, you know, that's great if you, you know, had a corporate career and that allows you to, to take some time out in between. That's fantastic. So well, it's been really inspirational to uh yeah to hear all of this uh... yeah can i can i say one other thing on that subject um because i wanted to add this but i think it's helpful for people to know too that um i also had to make changes in my lifestyle right so it wasn't like i had this you know job that allowed me just to take months off to to do all this i made a lot of changes in my lifestyle so i always tell people it's like what are the things you're willing to give up you know, I knew I downsized my living, I changed my lifestyle so that I could take that money and invest it in my business. So, you know, it's you have to work, like you said, with what you have, but there's also things that changes that we can make in our lifestyle that can free up those resources to put into, you know, your business. That's a really good point. Excellent. Thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah. So final question, what's your long-term vision for yourself and your brand? Right. So it, sometimes it just continues to evolve. And what's been fun about this process is I never really thought that I had a creative side. And I really didn't know that I had the ability to come up with all these business ideas. <laughs> but um, <laughs> This this experience has really spurred that. So I'm just going to continue to, A, produce, you know, more non-leather goods, I call it. Um, so I'll continue to work on that. Um, I really want to elevate my fashion activism. So um, I'm working on some projects right now that hopefully I can launch towards the end of the year that will kind of help me with that. And I, I just continue to push my limits on what I can do or, or what I can achieve. And um, that's the gratifying part is being able to just um, step out and push those limits. And, you know, it doesn't always work out. Sometimes it's a failure. But in those failures, you know, comes a lot of confidence in the fact that you tried. And then when the success comes, you know, that fuels more passion in me to go out and continue to try other things. Wonderful. I love that. You've been such an inspiring guest. I've loved hearing oh, about your, you. your business journey and you've really shared some absolutely valuable tips and advice for, for people. And I love what you do. So I'm very excited about getting myself some vegan cowboy boots, hopefully very Yay. soon. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for coming on the show, Kat. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Katrina. I really appreciate it. So that was Kat Mendenhall. You can find out more at catmendenhall.com. And that link is on the show notes page at veganbusinessmedia.com forward slash podcasts and going to episode 82. Now for our vegan business news roundup. The new generation of refrigerated plant-based milks are a more serious threat to their dairy milk counterparts, according to market research firm Packaged Facts. In Europe and the US, marketers of plant-based products are facing a backlash from regulatory bodies over their use of terms such as milk or butter to describe their dairy-free alternatives. David Sprinkle, author of a free white paper published for Packaged Facts, said, This is a battle for shelf space and consumer dollars. Sprinkle says that customers are rushing to the perimeter in supermarkets to select whole natural fresh products, including the refrigerated cases containing dairy and plant-based items, which are more attractive to customers than the centre core of supermarkets where long-life shelf-stable products are kept. He says... The new generation of refrigerated plant milks with almond milk and novel blends leading the dairy-free charge represent far more dangerous competition to dairy milk than the soy milks of yore safely tucked away in the centre store. So this is good news. It's fascinating seeing the rise in so many different and innovative plant-based dairy alternatives, and it's great that they're starting to become serious rivals to animal products. 
Now, it's not only plant-based milks and other dairy alternatives that are impacting the profits of animal agriculture businesses. The egg industry is starting to feel the pinch too. Shares in Calmain Foods, an egg producer since 1969 in Jackson, Mississippi in the US, has seen its shares drop 7% this week, that's August 2017 if you're listening in the future, after the company reported its first annual loss in more than 10 years, reports CNBC. The company announced a $74.3 million loss for the fiscal year 2017, including a net loss of $24.5 million in its fourth quarter alone. Calmain CEO Adolphus Baker blamed the growth in popularity of egg alternatives, including flaxseed, silken tofu and other products such as those made from potato and tapioca for the company's decline. How fabulous is this? (laughs) I mean, this is what we want, to put pressure on these industries to abandon the use and exploitation of animals and switch to becoming completely plant-based. Fantastic. Finally, the trend of vegan grocery stores continues, with the latest to open in Pennsylvania in the US, reports Veg News. The owners of vegan eatery Firefly Cafe in Boyertown will open the store next to the cafe in September this year. Firefly Cafe Outlet, as the store will be called, will sell a range of products including vegan cheeses, meat alternatives, household products and other items. What I love about Firefly, which only opened last year in 2016, is that they've been really creative in their marketing. They partnered with Boyertown train company Colebrookdale Railroad to launch a scenic all-vegan train ride and the cafe prepared all the food products sold on board. That's a smart and innovative partnership and it's great to see them expand their business so quickly. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a review and rating on iTunes or any other platform you're listening on. Finally, I encourage you to head over to veganbusinessmedia.com where you can find more resources, including details of my media and PR consultations, copywriting, editing and proofreading services to help you grow your vegan business. I'm Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business, and I look forward to catching up with you in the next episode of Vegan Business Talk. Bye for now.